Hello. Hello. Good Hello. evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to another Wednesday evening with the Clear Mountain Monastery community. Uh, this evening, we feel blessed and are very happy to have Tanisra with us. Uh, Tanisra, welcome and thank you for joining us. So I'll just read a quick biography uh, and people can follow along. We have a, a link in the notes. Um, so Tanisra started Buddhist practice in the Burmese school in 1975. She was inspired to ordain after meeting Ajahn Chah and spent 12 years as a Buddhist nun, where she was a founding member of Chithras Monastery and Amaravati Buddhist Monastery in the UK. She has facilitated meditation retreats internationally for the last 30 years and has an MA in mindfulness-based psychotherapy practice from Middlesex University and the Karuna Institute in the UK. With Kitty Saro, who we had on as a guest uh, some months ago, and who is her husband, she co-founded Dharmagiri Sacred Mountain Retreat and helped initiate and support a number of HIV and AIDS response projects in South Africa. In 2017, Tanisara and Kitisaro co-founded the nonprofit Sacred Mountain Sangha in Northern California, which hosts training classes, retreats, and events grounded in their unique synthesis of insight meditation and the Guan Yin Dharmas. In the early 2022, Tanisara co-founded Payen, um, probably mispronouncing that, but it's the People's Alliance for Earth Action Now, focused on Dharma-based climate activism. She has written several books, including two poetry books. Her latest book is Time to Stand Up, an Engaged Buddhist Manifesto for Our Earth. Tanisara is a member of the Spirit Rock Teachers Council. So Tanisara, that's quite the biography. I had to take a couple breaths in there. I couldn't uh, finish it all. Um, but maybe we could just start um, back at the beginning of your Buddhist biography. Um, could you say a little bit of something about how you uh, came to Buddhism and specifically what it was that drew you to the, the Burmese school, Burmese practice? Yes, well, um, thank you so much, firstly, for hosting me for this conversation. I'm very honored to be here and um, be with the Sangha. Um, yeah, it feels like a very different world way back then. Um, so I was... <clears throat> I, I didn't really know I was doing Buddhism, but I felt very drawn to meditation. I'd already been practicing yoga and reading a lot. There weren't many teachers or schools around at that time. There wasn't much available. Um, but it was really through friends of mine that suggested we went on this retreat together that was happening in a center that was being run by a Burmese family that were political, um, um, you know, exactly refugees, but they had to leave Burma at the, um, in the 19, late 1960s and so on. There was the political ferment that was going on there and they were quite well to do. So they bought this very large former stately home and turned it into a Buddhist center. And that was outside of Oxford and in the UK, and they were running these retreats. And so that was my first experience was going on a 10 day v, was called Vipassana retreats, which were in the, we were in the lineage of Uba Kin, Uba Kin, who was a lay teacher, whose monastic teacher was Lady Sayadaw. And Uba Kin trained Goenkaji, who's the most well known, but also Mother Sayama, who has a, both of them have a centers in the UK and around the world. And also one of my first teachers was John Coleman, who's American, and Ruth Dennison, who was also one of my first teachers. So there's a body of Westerners that, that he had taught. And it's a very rigorous, many, many people go through that doorway of the Vipassana retreats. And a very rigorous and a, and a particular sort of form of Vipassana, which I, I probably would understand it much more wildly, w widely now than was presented then as a much more of a methodology and technique of being with sensations in the body, etc. So um, I was very drawn into that and was quite involved in that community for about four years and beginning to help the first support the first retreats happening in the UK as some of the teachers were coming through, mostly but as a cook in the kitchen. I like to cook. <laughs> That's the one thing I felt pretty confident doing. There were so many other things I didn't really feel confident doing, but um, I could certainly cook. And so 
And it was there actually at one of those retreats that I first met Ajahn Chah. Yeah. Picking up on that, Tanisara, mm -hmm. um, so what, you know, you then went on to be uh, a nun for 15 years, I believe, or so, something like that? 12 years, yeah. 12, 12 years. And some of that, at least, with uh, at, at Wathapong in Thailand. And um, so would you speak about what drew, what were those first interactions with Longpur Cha like? What inspired you to, you know, to ordain with him? And um, just, can you give us some good Longpur Cha stories? Longpur <laughs> um, Cha was... Um... He was a happening. It was an event. He wasn't like a, it wasn't so much what he said because I wasn't. It wasn't really about what he said. But it was his presence. And so we had just finished one of these long ten. Well, it felt long. Of course, now we know it's a short retreat, but a ten day retreat, which was very intensive. And at the end of the retreat, we were sitting. There were these Nissan huts at the back of the stately home, which had been built as for those um, evacuee children from London in the Second World War. So there were sort of these long cedar wooded huts, which the retreats were held in. And through the front of the doorway, we were sort of, there wasn't even a Buddha, we were just sitting, right? So in fact, getting the, the space ready, a few of us, there was a Buddha there, but we didn't know it was a Buddha. So we just like had put it, like there's this sort of Asian thing. And we just like put it on just like, <laughs> so, <what is> it? <laughs> so the very first thing Ajahn Chah arrived and he and Ajahn Sumedho came through the front doors of this Nissan hut and we were all sort of sitting looking towards those doors. I think the first thing that struck me was the vibrate, it was the frequency, it was like the, the, the energy. The, it was like they had just walked from another planet. You know, it was it was so impactful for me. And they they looked odd together. Like at that point, Ajahn Sumedho, Lumpur Sumedho was very tall and thin, and Ajahn Chah was very small and rotund. So they sort of looked, but they they were had this incredibly pure uh, vibration. And the first thing Ajahn Chah, he looked, because we were about 70 young Europeans sitting together in this retreat, so he just sort of looked bemused, interested and bemused um, at this sitting there. And then he kind of looked around and he saw, he kind of like saw this Buddha. And so he got this, there was this little table. He kind of put the table in the front of the hall and he got the Buddha and he put it on there and he kind of dusted it down and then he bowed. So that was my first teaching for Ajahn Chah, was this feeling of him, seeing him bow because that felt what I felt, and I think by then I'd done quite a lot of these retreats, and so I was in quite a receptive state, and I just felt this was the the most deepest expression of how to be in life that I had witnessed, and I think there was something away in the way that Ajahn Chah carried himself, so it just wasn't someone bowing, there was some very profound sense of him really entering a bow, and what that really fully meant. And all of that was communicated. So I snuck out of the retreat and um, went to listen. Uh, he was speaking to students. I think they were Oxford students. They'd all come over to the retreat center. And I was listening. Of course, I couldn't understand. It was being translated into Thai. But I was sitting there with the translation just the whole time feeling this is really, really good. This is excellent. This is wonderful. So I was, I was feeling this incredible, exquisite sense of, um, sort of like arriving into this space that felt really like I, this is the space I want to be in. And at the end of the talk, he said, if you've been sitting there thinking this is good or this is not good, you haven't been listening properly. And then I thought immediately, that's really good. <laughs> so I was already hooked by Ajahn Chah. And, um, you know, I sort of went to, they had a vihara in London. I just tried to hang out with him as much as I could. Well, in that first, that was 1977. This was his first visit to, to the UK and to the West. And every, every exchange, every situation, I felt really inspired. And then I had opportunity. I was sort of taken by the Goenka people, they they offered, because I'd been cooking so much, they offered to take me to India to their retreat center. And by long route of quite sort of, you know, not to go into that whole story, I managed to 
get myself to Wat Ba Pong in the northeast of Thailand. Actually, it was on the way to what was then Rangoon and Burma or Myanmar and, and um, Yangon. And um, I was insistent that with the group that I was going to go waylay that journey and go up to what that was all I really wanted to do was go to Wat Ba Pong. So I arrived at Wat Ba Pong and he wasn't there. So I was really disappointed. And um, a friend was going to come with me and then she decided not to come when we were about to get on the train. An American friend and I was like, why? And she said, oh, because there's communists there, up there on the, and I'm like, I, I don't care if I don't, you know, it's like there's communists and mosquitoes. I was really puzzled by that. I was like, well, so what? You know, so anyway, so I land up on my own up there and and a little bit lost, you know, like, oh, now I'm here. I don't know what to do. And then a Westerner came by that could speak Thai. And he said, by the way, Lung Po is at this small monastery on the Mekong River. I don't know the name of it. And I'm going there and let's go and get some offerings and we'll go. So we went and he was there with another monk and I went to pay respects. And then he just, the usual thing, like, what are you doing and why are you here? That kind of thing. And so I had this whole story about enlightenment, which was of course ridiculous, but anyway. And then he, he just looked and said, well, everything you need is in your heart and go be a nun. So there was one Western nun at that point, uh, Mei Chi Kung Fa. And so she was American and she was very inspired. There was a different journey that transpired around her process, actually, as it turned out. But I spent time with her. And then I started to think I better go back. And, you know, I hadn't told my parents. I had a, there was a boyfriend who was wanting to get married and there were friends. I just I better go back and tell them I'm going to be a nun. So then I got back to England. And um, just as they were opening the first monastery in the UK, Chithurst Monastery, so then Ajahn Chah, by the time I got back, Ajahn Chah had come to and got back from this whole journey from in Asia. He'd come back the second visit and his last visit to the UK. So I went to pay respects again, again at the Oxford Centre. And he saw me and he looked at me and he said, why did you come back? Why did you? You should have. And I felt really mortified. And I was trying to say, well, you know, I had to, I had to go and tell. But... Um, but then he he sort of softened a bit. But then I rang up my friend. This is a, I mean, there's a lot of different stories because he came to our community where we were hosting the retreats, and you know he just he just sort of he just went well. Have you all had enough? You know, have you like this? Who am I? Like, have you had enough? And that was really impactful for me. It was like, have you had enough of sangsara kind of feeling? That was the feeling. And I was like, yeah, yeah. I, I kind of. Um, thought I did, but clearly didn't. But, <laughs> I did. <laughs> but then when when I went to the second time when I was at the Oxford and he was there, I called up my friend from this community and said, "You've got to come and meet this meditation master." So she came, and I sort of dragged her over, and sort of knocked on the kuti he was in, and and I'd always known him as quite friendly, and and then he suddenly looked like really stern. He opened the door, and there's a few monks there, and they invited us in. And I had to sort of, I started to feel nervous. I thought it's like the going in the lion's den. I felt like, oh, this doesn't feel. <laughs> and then he sort of looked at me and he said, Do you understand anatta, like no self? And I mean, like an idiot, I went, Oh, yeah, no self. And <laughs> so I started talking about no self, like not knowing what I was talking about, of course. And as I was talking, my sense, I could feel my sense of self and him getting, and the whole room getting more empty. And I could feel like I was getting very embarrassed and I didn't know how to stop talking. And so in the end, I just sort of petered out, hoping that the floor would swallow me up. And he said something in Thai. And Ajahn, I think it was Ajahn Sumedha that was translating. He refused to translate it. And then he said it again more forcefully. And then... <laughs> I just made a lean over. He said, he says you're very ignorant. <laughs> and it was just like, you know, like this needle in a balloon just pop. And I was like, Shh. I was like both incredibly honored that he'd like pop my balloon of, you know, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and embarrassed because I had my friend there and, 
And um, yeah, that was one of the last exchanges I had with Lung Po Cha. And um, the, la the very last one was I had been really impacted. And now I was faced with I couldn't get back to Thailand. And about 20 miles from the community where I was staying, they were building the beginning of clearing out Chithurst. They didn't have any nuns. There were three women staying there. And I had the option of going there, you know. And I I did I had to do something. So I wrote a list of what should I do now. At this point I was about 22 years old. And at the bottom of the list, in a very shaky it was like go to the monastery. And it was literally that day Ajahn Chah came to that village with who was then Ajahn Anando, one of the senior monks. He'd been a Vietnam vet and became was an abbot. And he, what, he was bringing his parents to show him this traditional English village, this quaint English village. So they were, so that's kind of the kind of village we lived in, running this center where we ho hosted these small retreats. And so there was this knock at the door, and I opened the door as Ajahn Chah. And I'm like, well, clearly my list. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> it's like, just tear that off. And so I went to Chithurst and then basically didn't leave for 12 years. Yeah. Well, wow. yeah, 12 years can be a long time in a monastery. Um, I'm curious, a lot of people who start off in a Burmese tradition, maybe especially a uh, Goenka tradition, one of the uh, strong aspects of that tradition is it's got a very clear technique that one is doing. And I'm curious how, if and how your practice changed over the courses of those 12 years. I mean, Ajahn Chah's teaching is much less technique based and you're kind of just living um, yeah, trying to live the teachings. Um, there's bowing, which didn't, um, you know, doesn't exist in many Goenka, if if not all Goenka centers. And um, yeah, how did your your practice change, and uh, did it fill out over those years? It, it was almost immediate because I had already I'd spent I was before I mean on the way when I was on the way to Thailand I'd already met a Jin Chan. It was already I already felt like the impact was working. Um, but I was I did six months at Ikat Puri outside of Bombay, Mumbai, uh, as that was also being built and emerging of this intense. And I was already inwardly disaffected with the technique. It really, I didn't really feel, and I had with me the whole time, even though one wasn't supposed to have the book, I had the Zen teachings of Huang Po, um, which basically sort of undermines the premise for anything really and everything. So I, I already felt very aligned with this sense of mind only, kind of, you know, contemplating mind, but I wasn't really sure how to do that. And so very quickly I felt I started, and with Ajahn Sumedho's teachings as well, um, this sort of right view or this contemplative, reflective approach directly on mind both the objects of mind and then also turning, you know, turning into, um, Ajahn Samadhi used to call it minding the gap or the, the non, the formless, um, the awareness itself, however we speak about that. Um, it felt very, I felt like I would, I was recognizing something that made sense to me and that was something that I, so, I really, I, I think when I really began to get Ajahn Chah's, I wouldn't say, I mean, that I, I don't think I'm still getting it, you know, it's not like I've got it, but I was getting, was um, a moment into the monastic training when I felt very, um, I, th I was still trying though to get somewhere, <laughs> you know, like trying to get, uh, get to some st refined state, even so, because there was that kind of affect from the Goenka. It was very powerful, and you could get into some very refined samadhi type spaces. And that was still like I was so I was still, even though I was getting this other approach, I was still had that impact in influence internalized. And there was this moment where um, I got you know, overwhelmed by the hindrances, especially I got very angry about something that happened, which was, it was completely nothing to do with what happened, which was ridiculous, but it was to do with being stuck in this, in this monastic training. 
and it and it was very very um i mean it was it was it was i was stuck <laughs> I was stuck. I couldn't. I, I couldn't stand anyone. I couldn't leave. I couldn't. You know. I was sleep deprived. I was hungry. It was cold. You know. There was this sort of and and so this very raw sense of anger came up and upset. It all came. All the and I realized that in any other situation, I would have distracted myself, left, walked away, and I couldn't do anything. So I just had to meet the mind. And I think it was in that moment I really got this whole way of working directly with dukkha. You know, I mean, it sounds really simple, but it, it was a profound shift for me. And then I, and then it was like the whole path started to open up of what was being taught through the, that monastic approach of Ajahn Chah. Was like you can't go up or down, or you can't move. Then you really start to know where to place your attention. You know, and, and so it, it began to feel less and less technique orientated and more direct reflection on on what's arising within the context of the truths and Nietzsche um, and that are and so forth. Dinesar, it's so wonderful to hear you speak about these, your path and how the teachings have wound their way through it. And um, I'm curious, when you point to the transcendent mind, um, I know you've spoken in interviews about your first, uh, it was, a, I believe, a psychedelic trip where you were sitting next to God chatting. And it seems like since then, there's been these moments of touching and pointing the heart more and more towards the mind uh, or guanyin or um, refuge of that kind. Um, and yet in the Theravada, we have such, um, so little language for that. And I find many people have to kind of use language from other traditions to sort of catalyze that movement in the heart. Um, so I'm, I'm curious, how have you uh, conceptualized that practice of taking refuge in, in the mind and the heart um, in, the, in the Theravada? And um, particularly this moment which you've given so much attention to of, of climate change, where um, we are in a sense, there is this sense of being trapped and many people feel that way. How do you find refuge for the heart within those shifting conditions of, of Dukkha? Well, wow, that's such a, uh, yeah, that's a deep, wide question. And uh, it's like, yeah, I thank you for that. Um, it is a process for sure. So, um, um, I mean, as much as there's been a lot of, I think, being we help, help filling in some of the gaps that were not present for me in the, I think the roots are all there in the Theravada, for sure, mm -hmm. and the core, and that's never left me, and the profundity of that core, and how much that is, like the, you know, the, the bread and butter of everything that I do, so to speak. Um, the... Um, the piece that I think was a little bit I needed to uh, to, to find a way to fill in was the the sense, particularly in the monastic era that I was in, and I know it's 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 shifting and changing, so I can't really speak to it now because I I disrobed thirty years ago, so it was a very and it was the first generation, and the focus was a lot on the letting go and the 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 world you kind of you know, we're going to leave the world and, and you can't really leave the world. Um, you know, in terms of the, you can leave the world in the mind, you know, the worldly dynamic, but the, you can't, until we die, it's, I think there was this confusion between the world of form and releasing your identification with the world. It's, it somehow got conflated with, I think I, it's like leaving the world was like, literally not having anything to do with anything <laughs> it was you know. so i i feel like the the guanyin archetype or being or however we understand guanyin the one that listens is the one that also teaches the heart sutra where that distinction between internal and external form and formlessness is dissolved so um 
the seed of that, I, I really feel it is in the Theravada, you know, like turn the mind to the deathless, uh, to to um, the kind of sense of ease within the conditions that the Buddha had, his fluidity. I mean, I, th I, I sort of refer a lot to the Buddha's life itself, like he was definitely engaged, talking about systems change, climate. I mean, we're looking at, talking about the dependent origination so we can internalize that and see the engine of samsara and where we break those links. So uh, it doesn't seem like such a big shift to apply that to the systems that we're in. What is what is the engine of these systems? And of course, it's directly linked to mind, uh, the poisons of the mind, in, in particular in terms of the breakdown, um, the delusion primarily and everything else. But then how do we break those chains and, and what do we replace it with? So that is my place of interest. How do we apply the medicine of the Dharma to this moment and not and, and dissolve some of the the um, this, this subtle split that can be at the core of Theravada? You know, this sense of I'm, you know, the world of form and how that can sometimes play out. Like we don't really take care of our bodies very well we don't in the thai tradition those those monks that were so profound practitioners and i would never you know it's not a critique by any means but there was a sense of like well we won't really worry about the body you know it's just here and i think this sense of being you know picking up form consciously to nurture, to, you know, that I think that is more the feminine impulse. I don't really want to gender that, but the nurture, maybe rather not gender, the nurturing impulse, the compassion impulse that is in great balance with the wisdom and the letting go. And I think the era that I was in the monastic chain, there was a lot of emphasis of letting go and not really much understanding because we were a young community and maybe we just didn't really know how to hold, what are we letting go into? You can't just let go if there's nothing that's going to catch you very easily. You, the psyche won't really do that, even however much will we might use. It's a surrender moment. So that compassion, or and I think with Ajahn Chah's presence, though it would be because he was very he did have this compassion. You felt he was very Guan Yin like. I think. I think there was this sense of it would be more easy to let go. You know, um, and in the culture and the devotion and the faith, you know, it was embedded in a thousand years of this transmission. And we were not in that situation in West Sussex, starting off in England, you know, that as young people with a lot of perhaps over leaning into the use of will and um you know, not really understanding that with the, the expression of wisdom actually is compassion. So I think the, the Guan Yin, the, the Heart Sutra, the merciful responses, the Shurangama Sutra, which is very much turn your mind back to its own nature. Mm. Um, and the fact that, that our, uh, there was also an affinity that organically arose between Master Xing Hua's lineage and our lineage of mutual, you know, um, monks primarily, but the um, one of uh, our pastor, Mel Zeki, now and myself did go to the city of the 10,000 Buddhas as nuns. There was this sort of cross pollination um, that was I, very early on. I was reading all their suttas and texts, and I mean, I couldn't really understand them all by any means, but I felt I, I felt very, it felt very sort of familiar somehow. I just thought, oh. Uh, so I, I was ferociously reading, as along with our Theravada. Well, we didn't really study a lot in the ter in that era. You know, Ajahn Charles read the Book of the Heart. So, um, yeah, for me, they felt very, very complementary. I didn't really feel that these were two mass. They're very different lineages in many ways. Mm. In essence, I think because of them being monastic, and deeply rooted in a deep sense of devotion and faith. Mm. That there's this great, you know, symbiosis. Mm. Just a note for people who are tuning in live, uh, both on Facebook and YouTube, you can put in questions uh, that we can ask Tanisra just in the chat in either one of those venues. Um, but Tanisra, I'm curious, uh, you've done a lot 
since you ended up leaving the leaving the robes and moving to Africa. And you mentioned these Guanyin Dhammas, compassion, emptiness, this being the knowing, that which hears. Um, and I'm curious how you take those into the world, how you have taken those into the world, because that's something which really shakes people up. And that's the reason why a lot of people go to the monastery. It's because they don't yet have a footing in those Guanyin Dhammas or the bread and butter of the um, the Theravada. Um, so how have you been able to do that? Well, I think, uh, you know, the journey through um, our journey <laughs> through South Africa at the time that we were there, which was a massive political ferment as apartheid was falling and a deep rural area that was where there was still a very profound division between the white and uh, Zulu community, African community. And um, yeah, in the particular area, we were a lot of racial division, and there was also was a low key um, kind of low low key kind of um, war a, a war going on. Actually, there was a a a, um, a uh, war that had been inflamed by the white nationalists. It you was know, their last grab of power, I think, to divide the African community between the ANC and the, the Zulu part of the IFP. So anyway, that's a whole background. But so um, I. Th- it was a little overwhelming. There was a lot of violence, a lot of... Um, so, and this whole journey that unfolded wasn't something that we actually went in, like, we're going to do this. It just unfolded and we were somehow in it and we took the steps to continue accepting the invitation to engage. And um, the practices that really, all of these practices then became important, all of them. Because we were we weren't with a we didn't have a monastery we didn't even have a sangha really, and so there was a lot of rely we and we did a lot of deep retreats during that time, and we were really relying a lot on the not only the practice we learned the deep practice in the, as monastics you know the service the the, the letting go the but also um, the response body of Guan Yin to respond. I mean, we, we lined up in the middle of the AIDS pandemic in that area. And it was it was clearly not a situation where you can just sit that sit this out and we had to find some wise response. So there was a lot of engagement in these ways of responding, but it was all really rooted in this, in what we'd learned in the monastery and the development of the Guan Yin Dharmas. And that, that was expressed through doing a lot of the chants, the protection chants, the parita chants, the great compassion mantra Guan Yin, the, cer- the great compassion ceremony. And so we started to do these for ourselves. And it, they had they really felt they had a power, to a protective power. Because a lot of people had, a lot of white people, I mean, actually across all races, people had guns, but people, the white people had guns because they were terrified in our area. And there's good reason that they, and it, and we had this decision: Are we going to get a gun? <laughs> it's like we're going to get a gun. You know, that's not that's not going to happen. So we're going to have to put our faith in the Dharma. You know, that's that's you know, if something happens, it's going to happen probably because of karma. You know, but right now, and that was our expression of it was you know to really put our faith in these practices that the Buddha taught. You know, the protections, the the ethics. The, the compassion to people and ourselves. And, you know, in those we were involved for, for nearly 30 years. And during that time, in all sorts of situations, we felt very protected. And, it, and you know, we also were very careful how we moved in those spaces. Um, but I, f- I felt that they were, that, that also drawing on those practices started to really bring in a, a cosmology of the Dharma. It was like there's this, you know, we in the Western scene, particularly the secular Buddhist scene, the Dharma scene, I don't think people even identify as Buddhist so much, the insight movement and so on. There's a great sense of I'm doing this as an individual, you know, for my path and practice. And I think for me more and more it's become we're in this cosmology of of beings and some of them are unseen, but we're invoking them. You know, whether subtle, whether, you know, Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, whether Dharma protectors, whether devas, whether elemental great beings, 
they sort of feel like they've become real and very much. And so all of that's really translated, everything that emerged in working on the ground in that context we were in, in KwaZulu-Natal in South Africa, really when we arrived in, <laughs> we arrived in America, it almost felt, oh, that's great, we arrived in America at the end of the empire. It always feels like everything's like falling apart. <laughs> like you know it's it's just in such a mess and and of course inevitably it would be a mess because it's grounded in it's ground you know it's a colonial colonized colonized space and it's that's only happens built on massive amounts of violence and oppression so it feels like even more that these practices are like really important and in, and because we haven't got the power of the monastic form which has its own power the guanyin the Guan Yin practices rooted within the Theravada really offer a, a, a really strong container, I think, for this time yeah. and this space that we're in. Yeah. So we have a question. Um, where did you ordain and how wonderful it was an option then? Um, yeah, well, it, it kind of... <laughs> That was a that's another whole story, which, but yeah, there weren't very many women. In fact, we were the first four four of us, um, other than Kung Fa, who was in Thailand, who I mentioned earlier. Uh, Mechi Kung Fa, who was American, was the only Westerner, I think, uh, first and only in Thailand, uh, pretty much. Um, the first four of us, I think, were the first four that I know that ordained. Um, perhaps even in Theravada in the UK, not necessarily in the whole of the West, but um, and there were no, there were uh, there were no elders available uh, in that lineage. We didn't hear very much. We didn't see them. So we were forging something. We were basically. I mean, I felt like I ordained as a monk. You know, like that was who we were in the wake of what the monks were doing. Until it became obvious we weren't we weren't really monks. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, but yeah, we did ordain and there wasn't really the full ordination, the bhikkhuni ordination. That, that was sort of so under wraps. We, I didn't even know about it for quite a long time, but we were ordained as Mechis, the eight precepts. And then we took another ordination of the Sila Dara, the ten precepts. But our lifestyle was very much within the Vinaya, really, and we were following that pretty much. And, you know, it felt a very, it was a very deep, and I'm so grateful for that training and mm -hmm. for that opportunity. It was, you know, I feel like it, it gave us the foundation to do everything else we've been able to do. Yeah. But I did, where did I do? Sorry, that was the main question. In England, yeah, in England, we had uh, Bunty, a uh, venerable, um, was a Sri Lankan monk, Ruwata Dharma, I think it was from London, uh, he came down and he he actually gave the precepts and the ordination and then Ajahn Sumedho chose our Pali names. Mm -hmm. So we were given Pali names, which I was very honored to receive and decided to kept, keep it after I disrobed. Mm -hmm. And can you, could you tell people what it means? Tan, Tan is foundation. Isra, the Thai translation that they gave me of that Isra is freedom, foundation of freedom is what it is, is Isra in Pali is connected with Ishvara, which means like creator, Lord, that kind of a meaning. But I quite like the original one, foundation of freedom, as it was given to me with that meaning. Mm. Um, thank you. Uh, another question. Uh, what is your view of surrender on the spiritual path? Well, I think that's where it brings you to. <laughs> mm. <laughs> People has to bring you to that point. I, you know, I, I mean, it's what are you surrendering to? That's the thing. You know, it's uh, you. You're really surrendering to the Dharma. You know, every means, whether it's a teacher or a method or a training. That's the, you know, as Ajahn Chah said, that's the peel of the fruit. You know, that's what's the container. That's. Um, but we're, we're surrendering, you know, the entering the stream, this idea of entering the stream is, um, and I really align with the way Ajahn Sujito talks about that. It's so sort of a, a, a shift or Ajahn Mahabur talks about a shift of lineage. Hmm. It's a shift of lineage from the cognitive, as Ajahn Sujito's idea of the cognitive 
frame the the placement of the sense of self is within hell so profoundly not only with the sankara the deep patterning much of it anusaya is not necessarily conscious to us but it kind of appears a lot at the tangible level within the cognitive puncture of the mind the thinking and the and so that we rely on that for our orientation and it's that really that we're surrendering that over reliance on that dualistic mindset that's based in you know the subject object that's constantly dividing and separating out we're surrendering into this um yeah, what do you want to call the jitta? You know, Jamahabur just called it jitta, the, the pure knowing of the heart, if you like. In that, you know, the being the knowing, as Ajahn Chasi, or Ajahn Smeda, being the knowing, the, the, the prajna, I like the Sanskrit of panya, prajna, sort of like before you know dualistically, I am this and you are that, the pure knowingness of beingness, right? So, and you know, it's a state of unknowing, really. It's a state of not fixing. So that is a surrender for the mind. You know, the the mind, what we usually call the mind, that surrender into a more intuitively based, direct way of being in relationship with this moment, with the unfolding of the Dharma. So I think that's the sort of sense of constantly surrendering and learning to trust a different orientation within which we move through life. And that's why I was going back to the beginning of what my first moment of meeting Ajahn Chah and seeing him bow, that was why it was so meaningful for me. Mm. I wouldn't have even known why it was so meaningful for me at that moment. But for me, it was the, it was the gesture of what do you do in this life? You bow. And I understood that's what you do. You bow. You you do. Surrender is a sort of odd word, is it? it you know, it's not like giving up discernment or wise agency. <laughs> it's not like you just surrender to any old thing, but to surrender to the Dharma, so that we are, as Ajahn Chah say, the conduits for the living Dharma. You know, and that is something else. You know, as he he would say, it's a place of freedom, a place of no falseness, I think he talked about the lack of the end of being or truly authentic. So yeah, I think every point, every practice is to bring us to that point. Um, and it's not just one gesture, right? So you, why, why you have to bow so much or why you bow so much? Yes, so we forget, you know, so keep bowing. It strikes me one of the beautiful parts of the image with Longford Shah is the fact that he had to take the Buddha image away from the corner and put it into the center again. So yes, what you're, what you're indicating with not just bowing to anything, like you do bow, but you have to kind of take the thing from the windowsill and put it where it deserves to be. Yes. Yeah, yeah exactly. Exactly. Yeah, he was, yeah, it was the complete gestalt of that, that teaching of bowing to the Buddha, you know, that's you... Ajahn Samadhi would say that, you know, who's in, who's riding the chariot, you know, who's in charge, like, is it the Buddha or is it your, <laughs> you know, what's, yeah. Well, Tanissa, we have um, one more question. I mm. think, I think we can go a little over time for it. Could you describe the Guanyin practices you find most powerful? Well, they're all really uh, profound. I, I, um, there are so many, the subtle one of listening, deep listening, listening back into your original nature, you know, what remains or, but the actual forms of the practice, the bowing, there's a, the beautiful bow practice, a collective, you know, communal practice, beautiful mantra, the holding of Guan Yin's name. I really like the Great Compassion Mantra, reciting that mantra, is, it feels very, which manifests the energy body of Guan Yin, the 42 hands and eyes, it feels really protective. And I like doing this, the ceremony, we adapted the ceremony uh, for lay life really, and um, from the original Chinese, and it's, it's um, we do it often, and it feels particularly doing it as a collective, I find it quite, you know, there's a lot of bowing in it, a lot of reciting. <laughs> um, I, I find it quite challenging, but I always feel it's very transporting. 
And I always feel the blessings of it is a very tangible. So I think this, this way of doing these practices and offering the blessings, it's, um, I really feel from the, you know, not only Guan Yin, Guan Yin, the heart of Guan Yin is all of the stream of awakening, however, for whatever forms we feel that, you know, Buddha, Buddhas, I think the transferring of those blessings is really important at this time for lifting the frequency of the planet into something that has uh, can has a taste of peace and compassion. I mean, there's so much that is, you know, I suppose like the do- demons stalking the land everywhere, putting people into states of delusion and confusion and violence. To Nisra Adai, ethic of listening is so readily apparent in just how you speak and the care. Um, and it's really just a pleasure to have you uh, on and to share and hear your your wisdom and just for all you've done for the, the Dhamma, like carrying that Buddha image to South Africa and then to North uh, America with you so we can all, you know, help bow to it is just a uh, thank you. And uh, just really appreciative of you being part of this, um, you know, meeting the community. And if you're ever near Seattle, please come visit us in our non our non building. <laughs> so. we, we will definitely come and visit. Thank you for the invitation. And thank you so much for hosting me. And thank you for uh, wearing the robe and your dedication and devotion to the path of the it's so profound and so needed also. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you very much. And uh, for people who are interested, we'll now go over to zoom, uh, we put the link in the chat. And Tanisra will join us there. So mm. uh, people should feel extra encouraged to come visit. Um, Ajahn Nisibo is still on retreat for another month plus, um, but he's still going on alms round every morning and uh, going in on Saturdays to St. Mark's uh, teaching in person. So, but yeah, we'll see you next week. We'll actually have another interview next week with a Thai monk named Ajahn Banot. And uh, you can all join us there next week. But Tanisra, thank you very much. Yeah. Blessings. Thank you, everyone.